It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and all the late-night revelers have already called it a night. The last bar at the end of the street is preparing to close, but there's an issue. The bartender is struggling to persuade a persistent, inebriated customer to leave. Seated at the bar is a disheveled individual, insistent on one more drink. The bartender, clearly frustrated, wants to go home. Closing time, the bartender gruffly announces, just one more, the intoxicated patron protests, emphatically shaking his empty glass. I've got money, he adds, laughing and belching, enveloping the bartender in a cloud of alcohol-scented air. This patron has been a disruptive presence at the bar all night, and the bartender has reached the end of his patience. Get out of here, the bartender orders as he escorts the swaying patron out of the establishment. You're done. The patron stumbles onto the street, feeling the full effects of the night's festivities. It's a rare occasion when he can afford to indulge himself, and this bar is his preferred spot due to its affordable prices and limited conversation. He turns back to confront the bartender, ready for a fight, disregarding their vast size difference. Anger has clouded his judgment. Don't tell me when I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists to strike. However, the bartender slams the door, thwarting his intentions. Defeated, the patron turns away from the closed bar and starts to wobble down the street. He curses the bartender under his breath while pulling up his collar against the chilly night air. He wishes for one more drink to counter the cold. In his current state, he doesn't realize the bartender did him a favor by preventing a fight he couldn't win. His vision is blurred and his head is swimming. He can hardly stand upright. Slightly delirious, he decides to continue his night rather than head home and sleep it off. He scans the storefronts, hoping to find another open bar, but each one disappoints with its closed sign. He's about to lose hope when he notices something glinting in the glow of a street lamp. He staggers closer, hardly believing his eyes. Luck is finally on his side. A partially filled bottle has been abandoned. Well, hello there, little friend, he mumbles as he struggles to focus. The world spins around him, and he questions his senses but he feels the weight of the glass bottle in his hand. It's undoubtedly real. Who left you behind? Who'd abandon a perfectly good bottle? He wonders. There's only a small amount left, but it's better than nothing. Without hesitation, he drinks it down, relishing the burning sensation as it warms his stomach. But what happens next astounds him. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if his mind is playing tricks on him, but the swishing sound inside the bottle confirms it. He takes another gulp, still more remains. Typically, he'd discard the bottle and move on, but something stops him. He keeps hold of it, raising it for another look, and indeed, it's not yet empty. The derelict is in disbelief. He feels as if he's hit the jackpot, a bottomless bottle. That bartender thinks he's so smart, he mutters while swaying unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. I won't ever go to his stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I'll never have to pay for drinks again. This is the best day of my life, he exclaims, raising his arms in triumph. Struggling to make it back to his rundown apartment on the seedy side of town, he collapses on the floor. The morning sun wakes the derelict, and he groans as he rises. His entire body throbs, and his mouth feels like a desert. Post-drinking hangovers are nothing new, but this one seems unusually harsh. He tries to push that thought aside and focuses on the peculiar, never-ending bottle he discovered the previous night, now lying beside him on the floor. Reaching out to touch it, he confirms that last night wasn't a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but he's not about to question his unexpected stroke of luck. Slowly rising to his feet, he makes his way to the bathroom, grappling with a hangover unlike any he's experienced before. His head pounds, his throat is parched, and his tongue feels swollen and unwieldy. Familiar with the remedy, he takes another swig from his magical bottle, but it offers little relief. To his alarm, he notices something strange about his scalp. His head itches uncontrollably, and he can't stop scratching it, as if he's dealing with a severe dandruff problem. Realizing a shower might help, he undresses and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast. The steamy water offers only temporary respite. As he dries off, the towels feel harsh against his skin, and his flesh comes off in large, flaky patches, leaving red trails where his nails scrape. Alarmed, he wonders if he's bleeding. 
Examining his fingers, he finds his nails have transformed into brittle, claw-like talons. He yelps in fear and bites them off with ease, as they appear unusually weak, almost as if he has a sudden calcium deficiency. He recalls the lectures in school, where the police issued dire warnings about the consequences of a lifetime of drinking. Those warnings, which he once scoffed at, now haunt him. It's probably nothing, he mutters as he gazes at his blotchy, infected-looking skin in the bathroom mirror. His hair and nails continue to grow out of control. His hair reaches his shoulders but comes out in large, ragged clumps when he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails keep breaking and cracking, leaving his fingertips bloody and his cuticles infected. If his appearance was already worse for wear due to his habits, it's truly dreadful now. Over the next week, he barely leaves his apartment. He hides behind closed curtains in the dark, dreading someone seeing him. When the landlord knocks on his door, demanding overdue rent, he remains silent. Fortunately, the landlord eventually gives up. The derelict takes this as a reprieve, a chance to ponder his deteriorating condition. He knows something is terribly wrong. Local bartenders are probably wondering where he's disappeared to. He's known for keeping the town's bar industry afloat single-handedly. He's certain that he's contracted a severe illness but believes he can tough it out. All he needs to do is get through the next week and everything will return to normal. Sipping from his never-ending bottle helps pass the time in a comforting stupor while he awaits his recovery. Regrettably, the situation continues to deteriorate for the derelict. His hair and nails keep growing uncontrollably, making it challenging to handle the bottle due to his twisted nails. His dry, flaky skin undergoes a bizarre transformation, thickening and turning into leathery folds that hang from his body like an elephant's or a rhinoceros hide. These folds grow so massive that they droop over his knees, gradually extending toward the ground. The added weight makes movement increasingly difficult. He initially suspected he caught a nasty bug, but now strongly believes the bizarre skin condition is linked to the mysterious bottomless bottle. Despite this unsettling transformation, he can't bring himself to part with the peculiar gift, and he continues to seek solace in its contents. He briefly contemplates going to the free clinic for help, but the fear of discovery, especially if he has an unknown parasite or condition, dissuades him. The thought of government labs and isolation terrifies him, so he decides to wait it out, hoping that a period of sobriety and rest might alleviate his condition. In desperation, he retreats to his bedroom while he can still manipulate the lock as the excess folds of skin on his hands and arms are hindering his actions. The weight of the added skin prevents him from walking much and he resigns himself to lying on the floor, isolated from the outside world, in the hope that it will all be a fading dream when he awakens. The only source of solace for him remains the never-ending bottle. After all, he believes the damage is already done and a drink won't hurt. A week passes and his condition shows no signs of improvement. The landlord, determined to collect the overdue rent, uses his own key to enter the apartment. What he encounters is nothing short of nightmarish. The furniture is in disarray, the floor is filthy, and a repugnant odor fills the air. It's as if someone has been living in isolation, with sealed windows and no ventilation. A noise from the bathroom catches the landlord's attention, and he assumes the derelict is hiding there thinking he won't be found. Stepping toward the bathroom with a sense of purpose, he intends to retrieve the money he believes is owed to him. However, what he encounters is no longer the derelict, and it's barely recognizable as human. The creature in the bathroom is a grotesque mass of skin folds. These skin flaps have grown to such a size that the derelict within can hardly move. They cover his entire body, making him resemble an alien sea cucumber more than a human being. The landlord recoils in horror, screaming at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's witnessing. To his astonishment, the creature reacts to the noise, and ripples of movement spread across its surface. It starts to move, despite lacking any discernible legs. In his terror, the landlord fails to notice a glass bottle dropping from between the creature's skin folds as it advances toward him, the same bottle, still containing three fingers of liquid inside. How could such a grotesque transformation occur? What kind of parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miraculous bottle he found? Sadly, the never-ending bottle isn't a blessing but a curse, and the man who discovered it that fateful night became another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. 
SCP-420 appears to be an ordinary bottle of a popular alcoholic beverage, even bearing the label of a common brand. The bottle consistently contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. When this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 always refills itself. While SCP-420-1 may resemble ordinary whiskey in its chemical composition, consuming it has effects far more potent than even the strongest alcoholic beverages. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, it undergoes a peculiar transformation, gradually losing its potency until it becomes physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from urine. The consumption of potent SCP-420-1 initiates an unusual physical transformation known as SCP-420-2, progressing through six stages. In stage one, which begins 12 hours after consumption, subjects experience difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech unlike typical alcohol intoxication. Hair, fingernails, and toenails grow at an accelerated rate, becoming brittle and prone to breaking, often causing bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success treating SCP-420-2 in this stage, resembling an aggressive form of cancer with radiation, chemotherapy, and a continuous intravenous supply of Formula 420, a 09-TEAT-174B. Those treated have a 73% recovery rate and a 21% fatality rate. This treatment can slow the progression of SCP-420-2 but not halted completely from stage two onward. In stage two, which begins one to two weeks after stage one, subject's skin takes on properties similar to hair and nails from stage one, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. The old skin flakes off, replaced by new skin growing at an accelerated rate, forming thick, leathery folds all over the body. These skin flaps develop within the mouth, affecting speech and ultimately rendering subjects mute though they can still breathe and eat. Subjects in stage two exhibit increased appetite, possibly to support the body's demand for nutrients and calories needed for the growing, calloused skin. They often attempt to consume inedible or poisonous objects and may perish as a result. In stage three, which starts three to six weeks after stage two, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the subject's central nervous system. Genetic testing reveals that the skin's DNA has mutated beyond human classification, resembling a separate inhuman organism resembling a parasite attached to the human host. Tumor-like growths may appear, analogous to human muscle and secretory cells, while hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the skin. By stage four, which commences three to seven days after stage three, the skin is transformed into a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point of their disappearance. The skin exhibits random twitching movements, resembling a living organism. Subjects continue to eat, although they no longer control their mouths. Instead, the skin entity moves the mouth by manipulating the attached skin. Small holes form in the skin, growing into narrow tunnels or throats, leading back to the trapped subject's body. Subjects remain driven by insatiable hunger, consuming anything they can get in their mouth. In stage five, starting one to two days after stage four, the skin demonstrates rudimentary intelligence. It remains attached to the original subject, but is entirely non-human, capable of moving independently, dragging the host along. It feeds like an oversized amoeba, excreting a digestive enzyme onto food, enveloping nutrients with its skin folds, and taking food into the throats. These tunnels, now directly connected to the host's circulatory system, function as additional mouths, consuming nutrients conveyed by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates. Most hosts remain in stage five indefinitely, with an even more dangerous stage six looming. Stage six is not well understood, but it involves further accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a significant increase in size and mass. During this process, hosts may maintain their sanity or reach a calm, self-aware state accepting the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is securely contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed Foundation site and can only be accessed by SCP staff with Level 3 clearance or higher. It is classified as safe due to its stationary nature. Samples of SCP-420-1, not in use for testing, should be stored in the designated container until they lose potency.
at which point they are disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Subjects infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be held in standard solitary D-class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects reaching Phase 4 are closely monitored for signs of further advancement, and if needed, they are immediately destroyed by incineration. Learning about the fate of SCP-420 victims serves as a stark reminder to avoid drinking from random bottles found on the street. Common sense should prevail.